What's the formula, Kenneth? <laughs> the Z170M OC formula, that is, apparently. This is a micro ATX Z170 motherboard from ASRock. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means it supports Skylake Socket 1151, so you can drop in your i7-6700K or other CPU in the Skylake family into this micro ATX motherboard. So let's take a look at the features. A quick look at the motherboard shows that it's pretty well packed, even for a micro ATX motherboard. They've really crammed a lot on here. We're looking at a 14-phase power design, and this supports uh, Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 K-series CPUs. It's got the ASRock B-Clock full range overclocking, and it supports the ASRock uh, Hyper B-Clock engine. This motherboard is, of course, based on the Intel Z170 chipset, which is sort of the overclocking enthusiast chipset. Uh, this motherboard does have two DDR4 DIMMs. It's a little disappointing. I really would have hoped that they could have crammed four DIMMs on here, but I'm not really sure where they would have put them. Part of the reason I think they went with two DIMM slots as opposed to four is because the extreme memory speeds that they support. This motherboard supports up to DDR4 4500. Now, you'll only get 4500 if you use one dim in this single channel memory basically but 4366 is supported in a dual channel configuration i don't have any memory that can do 4366 so i can't test that in terms of expansion slots we've got the, the first two by 16 slots are wired directly into the cpu that'll operate it by 16 and 0 or by 8 and by 8 depending on what you what kind of cards you get it populated with the bottom pci express by 16 physical slot is actually a pci express by 4 through the DMI. So the bottom one is, is for your NVMe SSD or something like that. There's also an M.2 that supports PCI Express and SATA M.2 drives, which is just below the main expansion slot. If you do use the M.2, do note that it disables one of your SATA Express ports on the front. Be sure to check the manual to make sure it's gonna work with a combination of peripherals that you're gonna use. If you're just getting a graphics card, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're getting a graphics card and a sound card and an HDMI capture card or you know other peripherals, you're gonna to have to do a little bit of homework to figure out which peripherals will work on what motherboard and in what combination and what set of slots. So just keep that in mind with this generation. Now in terms of the audio solution, this is a 7.1 channel HD audio solution that has the uh, content protection and the DRM and all that. So you can play Blu-rays and you know all that kind of stuff. It does have surge protection. This is ASRock Purity Sound 3. Uh, it does have Nishikon fine grade audio capacitors. It's 115 dB signal to noise ratio. For the headphone amplifier, it's a TI-NE 5532 premium headset amplifier and that supports up to 600 ohm headsets so if you're using fancy headsets well you've got the ti-ne 5532 headset amplifier that's what this uh, implementation uses the sound card is isolated from the rest of the motherboard pcb as we've seen for the last couple of generations so that's good in terms of noise isolation it has an intel gigabit i219v lan that supports wake on lan and pxc and all that kind of stuff at the rear panel, we've got a PS2 combination mouse and keyboard port, which is great for people like me that are still rocking the PS2 Model M. Got one HDMI port, one DisplayPort 1.2, and one optical SPDIF port. You've got two USB 2 ports. <laughs> That's got additional ESD protection that ASRock has had added. Then we've got one USB 3.1 Type A port, which is a 10 gigabit per second port, and then we've got one USB 3.1 Type C port. Now both of these are through an ASMedia 1142 controller, so that is a an ASMedia USB 3.1 controller. Then we've got four USB 3 ports. That's the Intel Z170, and they have additional surge protection and anti-static protection provided by ASRock. And then we've got a clear CMOS button on the back here as well. For the HD audio jacks, we've got you know rear, central, bass, line in front speaker and microphone. Let's take a look at the connectors along the bottom of the motherboard. We've got the front panel audio connector, we've got a Thunderbolt header for an add-in Thunderbolt card that you can use in the last PCI Express slot. Then we've got our secondary Thunderbolt header for the add-in Thunderbolt solution from ASRock. Then we've got two USB 2.0 headers, which you can use for the internal peripherals like a power supply or whatever. Then we've got our COM port header. Then we've got a chassis fan header. Now these do support three or four pin fans. We've got our diagnostic LED readout. This will give us a numeric code in case the system's not working correctly or not posting correctly. This will give us a clue as to what the problem might be. Then we've got two socketed BIOSes, which come with a sticker that tell you which version of the BIOS that it is or which version that it started out with. And then an AB switch that lets you toggle between BIOSes. So, hey, if you're flashing your BIOS and something goes wrong, oh, you can just flip it over to the other one. You can flip it over to the backup one. Then you'll be good to go. Then, of course, our front panel connector. Uh, rounding out the front edge of the motherboard, we've got our two SATA 6 connections. These are provided by the Intel Z170 chipset. Our two SATA Express connections, also provided by the Z170 chipset. And then we've got our SATA 3 6 gigabit per second ports that are uh, hooked in through the AS Media controllers. Then we've got switches. What are these? More switches. There's another fan header behind the connector here, but these on-off switches are for fun things like, is this in liquid nitrogen mode? And should we put the CPU in slow mode, which will run the CPU in its slowest supported configuration, which is maybe useful 
example, if you're trying to overclock this thing and you run into a problem, one of the switches here on the motherboard is for toggling the XMP mode on and off. So if you want to set the extreme memory profile of your memory through a switch rather than through the UEFI, you just toggle the switch on and the motherboard will automatically use your XMP profile from your memory without you having to do anything else. Then we've got our front panel USB 3 header. These are USB 3 ports provided by the Z170 chipset that are otherwise not available at the back of the motherboard. So this is for your front panel connection. Then we've got our ATX connector. Also next to the ATX power connector is a direct key button. This will take you directly into the UEFI if you press it. Turns out that's a handy feature when your computer can boot in one second from an M.2 SSD. Who knew? And we've got a bunch of buttons. We've got a menu button and a plus minus button. The plus minus button are for overclocking, so you can actually use those to overclock the system more sort of on the fly or less. You've got power and reset. And then you've got this header here, which has you know the PCH voltage and other voltages and ground that you can read out in case you're trying to do ridiculous overclocking. So you can actually hook up your voltage probe or your voltage meter to these and have a readout of these. Next to the RAM slot, just above the PCI Express connector, we've got our first CPU fan header and then tucked out of the way near the top of the motherboard, we've got a three pin CPU fan header that's for a water pump or auxiliary CPU fan or, or whatever like that, but it's a three pin connector, so keep that in mind. And then along the top edge of the board, we've just got the eight pin power connector. And then so we've got another fan connector just behind the IO shield for a total of five fan connectors. That's four four pin fan headers, and then the optional three pin fan header for the extra CPU fan or push pull fan or whatever. Overall, the thing that concerns me most with the board layout is the location of the M.2. If you're running a Samsung M.2 or one of the other M.2s that gets insanely hot, and you've got a graphics card that is dumping a lot of heat, the M.2 may not be able to breathe as well as it needs to in this particular location. I'm not sure where else the M.2 could have been located unless you, you know, use a vertical connection or something like that for the M.2 and have the M.2 sort of sticking out of the motherboard. So I'm not really sure that anything could have been done differently in the design to avoid placing the M.2 there. I would have to do some real world tests with a graphics card, a, a graphics card with a big cooler and something like a Samsung 951 that produces a lot of heat in order to confirm if that's actually an issue. I suspect that a fan at the front of the case would probably take care of, of any cooling issues this might have, but if you have one of these and you have any issues with that, please let us know in the forum at techsyndicate.com so that everybody else can sort of be aware of the situation with that. You know, comment, let us know, and it'll be part of the record. If you have one of these boards and you've got an M.2 and especially like an AMD graphics card that's producing just a ridiculous amount of heat and everything is fine, let us know that in the forums too. I'd be curious to know. I may end up using this motherboard in a portable capture computer build wherein I would have two HDMI capture cards and a graphics card in addition to an M.2 for the operating system and as a work drive. And so I may actually end up getting to test this to see exactly how it performs in terms of M.2 cooling. But really that's sort of the only complaint that I have for this motherboard. I am kind of surprised that this type of motherboard would be really popular in the liquid nitrogen overclocking crowd. Now I don't know very much about liquid nitrogen overclocking other than what I've seen at Computex and other computer shows like that. But ASRock tells me that this type of board layout is really popular for overclocking and that's why they've included some of the physical switch options that they have to make this a little easier for liquid nitrogen overclockers and other extreme overclockers to squeeze every little bit of performance that they can out of their Skylake CPUs. Well, it's been a quick look at the Z170MOC formula. Is this the formula for your next build? Let me know why or why not in the comments. I'd be curious to know. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you in the forum.